This is Governor Larry Hogan, and I don't always have time to listen to podcasts, but uh, I do enjoy listening to the Maryland Crabs podcast. Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. Hey, we're back again. We're at the Commons, and we're with a, I would say a, a stranger, because I've seen you around, but we're here with former Mayor Michael Panelides, and we wanted to catch up. We've been meaning to catch up with you since the election, okay. and you've been adeptly avoiding us. <laughs> I remember the day after the election, it was like, where's Mike? Where's Mike? <laughs> he, was at, he was at home. He's exhausted. Yeah. Obviously, the election was a surprise to everybody, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and not just uh, your election, but it's certainly what carried on the following year as well with uh, County Executive Shu and, uh, you know, just everything, everything in the things. So I guess the big question is, what have you been up to? Well, life goes on. You got on. hitched? I did. That's... They got married. Life goes on, as they say. So it's actually been nonstop. People thought I was going to take it easy, but got married, bought a new house, started a new job. So they say the two most stressful things in someone's life is... All right. So that's two of the trifecta. When's the kid coming? Um, I got, got mar- we'll marriage, it. house, and... Yeah. Yeah. What are you, a washerwoman? Just yeah. 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 gossip? Kids will be here. Who that's knows it. when? Who Can't knows really when? control it. <laughs> That's great. Well, congratulations on the Thank on the you. wedding, and uh, I'm glad you didn't go off into the sunset and whatnot. I know you've been uh, pretty active. I've seen you uh, testify at city council a couple times, and I've seen you um, at some of the public meetings. Yeah. And it's 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 great. I saw you in the parade on Sunday, the St. Yeah. Patrick's Day parade. So you were out there marching. What's um, you know, what what's been on your mind? What do you what are your thoughts on the election? I guess first thing, which is one of the questions that I wanted to ask way back when. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about not coming. I know I promised to come on, win or lose, but once you lose a tough election, I was like, I'm not talking to anybody. <laughs> You're not the first person to ditch us, frankly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think it was definitely interesting. Annapolis is always kind of the bellwether, if you will. So, you know, when I won my first election, people saw kind of a Republican wave coming. Then you saw Hogan, you saw Trump. Get it was a little wave. There was only 54 votes. Right. It wasn't a big 59 wave. votes. It wasn't a tsunami. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, it was a- but I mean, it kind of, you know, you saw Hogan and then the president's race after that. And same thing, the opposite. You know, after I lost, you saw the county executive lose. You saw the majority of Republicans lose. Um, I guess that's the one thing that made me feel a little bit better about it is you looked at New Jersey, North Carolina, in my election, like every Republican lost. Even in Maryland, there wasn't one Republican mayor that won. The guy in Fredericks, I think he was on his third or fourth term, probably more popular yeah. than me, got like slaughtered in the election. There's a bunch of little towns in Maryland, too, where they mm-hmm. lost Republican mayors. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. Uh, Cumberland yeah. was well, one. Was I, remember, I remember talking with uh, Steve Shue early on in this, and mm-hmm. uh, I know that he was his, his campaign was very cocky going into the very end of this. And I mean, even, yeah. even the day of election, oh, we're ahead by 15, we're ahead by 15. I know Dan Nataf had said, well, I think you're ahead by about four, and I think it might be a little bit tighter than yeah. that. And I had told Steve way early, I said, don't discount the, uh, the Me Too people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Women's March that we, we'd come off of the Trump Women's March in, was it December or January of 2017? And it was just, you know, it, it had gone on. It happened again in the summer. There was a smaller march and everything else. And, and they really did organize and they, they got out the vote. I think Steve got a lot of flack on social media for his comments about, you know, turnout and Trump and everything else. But when you talk about the numbers, that's really what made the difference. So if you think about it, for example, in the last three city elections, not this one, the three before, every election was within about 300 votes. So mm-hmm. Ellen Moyer's first one, when Josh won, when I won, there was only about a two to 300 vote difference. There was 2,000 more votes in this last election. So when we looked at our polling numbers, and I got just about the same number of votes I got the first time. And we were about 3% plus or minus with uh, Gavin and Steve Shoes. I think those polls are accurate because you always look at the same base. So, for example, 40,000 people in Annapolis, right? Mm-hmm. Only 25,000 registered votes. You know, 18,000 people vote in a presidential, down to 12,000, down to eight in a city election. Mm-hmm. So you're only sampling 8,000 people. And based on those, you know, I think the polls are accurate. We didn't anticipate 2,000 more people. And like you said, with coming the marches, they're not coming out to vote for me, right? Sure. There's a 20% increase in Democratic turnout. 
And when you're out number two to one, it's hard to make well, up. Well, I mean, one of the things I thought after the, after your election was that, and I remember we, we spoke with you on the phone and you said, well, I didn't think I would lose. Um, which, you know, I, again, in, in, when you wake up in the morning, uh, somebody's going home as not successful at the, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, whether you're playing football or politics. Yeah. And, um, you know, my thought was that you... You know, you came in under, I mean, I wouldn't say you were a mandate to come in at 54 elections. You won mm-hmm. that You yeah. won that election sure. over Mayor Cohen at the time. It was, uh, you know, a very exciting election. I mean, it came down to the wire and everything right. else. Um, but it's, a, it's been a Democratic town forever. And right. it's, it's flipped back. And I mean, it was, I always felt that Mike Panellides needed to be the Republican mayor that all the Democrats were going, huh? He's a Republican, yeah. and uh, and and I don't think there was that, you know, that reaction with the electorate here. Uh, I personally, I feel that you did a very good job for the city. I think Thank that you. you know the ship was sailing. You know, I mean, it veered and it moved. And I mean, you you took it through the channels and yeah. it was fine. Um, I think you left the city better than when you got it, and I think that's all anybody really can ask of any elected official or a boy scout. <laughs> um, no, I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I think the one thing, too, is, you know, when you look at it, there was a lot of factors in my first election. I obviously came in challenging, you know. I didn't get elected by a mandate, like you said, the votes, but there was issues that put me in office. So whether it was the two rounds of tax increases before, doubling the water bills, cutting trash to once a week, Crystal Spring, the faucets building, there were issues The faucet building was the top one. Right, yeah, that, that was... kind of put me into office. So... I thought I did a good job. You know, I got my budgets passed, uh, you know, eight to one in a, right. a town. And I asked somebody else, I said, name me one partisan thing I've done over the last four years. And they were like, I can't. So I tried to govern from the middle. But you're right. I wasn't able to resonate the way, say, Hogan did in terms of people yeah. were like, wow, I really yeah. he's done a great job. Um, well, and, but and he also takes a, Hogan takes a lot of heat from the Republicans and yeah. who don't feel he good. They call him a rhino. I mean, if you go into social media, yeah. which is the worst of all human <laughs> things, but he gets a lot of credit, gets a lot of flack from Republicans saying mm-hmm. that he's not conservative enough and he's not he, he's not pushing for, for uh, forward a conservative agenda, and he takes very little flack from Democrats except for but maybe he, the but hardest of governing, our left. He's not governing a red state. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, he's governing a purple state. Let's let's face it, uh, with you know probably a deep purple because it's a little bit closer to blue than it is right. it's red. And I mean, if he's going to be any kind of successful. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he's got to, I don't want to say bow to it, but I mean, he's, he's got to give, and he's probably got to give a little bit more to the Democrats than he does force what he wants on the Republican yeah. side. I think he was smart in the battles he picks. You know, we've had governors in the past to kind of pick every single battle, but he has had a lot of success. I mean, you know. Steve Shue could have learned from that. Exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> Steve <laughs> right. picked battles yeah. he didn't have to pick. No, you know? I know. And you, the Republicans right. are like, what are you doing? That's but if marijuana? you think about it, I mean, from... You know, Governor Hogan's point of view, you know, lower taxes and fees, cut regulations, the Bay Bridge went down, jobs grew. So he had a pretty, you know, great record on the economy. And you're right, he didn't get into the super hyper-partisan battles. Because they, oh, they went on the national level, which I always tried to avoid, but they'd always creep into city issues and people would get obsessed with national issues when they weren't really relevant. There's only a couple minor times I'd seen in city council over the last few years where you saw partisanship creep in. And it was a couple minor things. I mean, Fred Palin was upset once about uh, hiring an assistant or cutting an assistant. I can't remember. You're just staring. But he said if it was if this was a Democrat, it wouldn't happen, which he knows isn't true. But then on the other side, I oh, saw— Oh, the assistant city manager. And then I saw but the, the uh, when changing the elections. When they, mm-hmm. And they said, maybe we should put this on cycle. And, they, and we had mm-hmm. Alderman Finlayson said— well, no, this benefits us, so why would we change that? Yeah. So, those, But those are the only times that I saw partisanship really at a city level. And everyone knows um, that that There has- was some behind the scenes, you know, the Paris Accord and some other things. But you're right. Like, when I came in my first year, they wanted to strip the assistant city manager position out of it and strip my powers away to have a city manager form of That government. was clumsy. Right. But then, which actually was the best thing that happened. Right. When Lil Gavin came in, you know, Teresa got, I think, like a forty, fifty thousand $50,000 pay increase over her predecessor. And they were like, oh, that's fine. And so you went from, well, we got to cut the position for Mike, but we'll give it to Gavin. Right. So. Right. And then you also also had an addition in the mayor's staff as well. I know he's I think the- I'm still trying to get it. And they're very hard to get information out of. I've been emailing the alderman, too. I think on a percentage basis, his staff grew more than any other department, meaning police and fire grew in terms of dollars. But on a percentage basis with the arts and entertainment, the liaisons, his physical staff grew more than any other city department. In a percentage 
percentage, percentage yeah. term. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we've got yeah. a uh, you know we've got the African American liaison, which I don't believe we had under you, did we? We so we had the African American Hispanic for the first time. They were part time, and now they're full time. Right. Okay. I know they were full time. They were both part time, but they're full time now. Correct. Yeah. Oh, Correct. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I know that they have added the you know there's a chief of staff, which you did not have. I had one. They wouldn't let me call it a chief of staff. They wouldn't let me change name when Tara was there, and then now they did. So, no. um, but then they also had the um, did you the, pull the, whole, the guy that does hey, the mayor uh, sort of thing. Just yeah. kind of like call um, people what I want to call them. Yeah, we can get to that later. But that's actually the one thing that surprised me is kind of the council reactions to the things that he does and like the lack of pushback. Well, because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, which you always do, but the. It was interesting to me to see the new council come in because council really started banging heads with each other oh, yeah. and left kind of oh, yeah. Gavin out of the fray. Mm-hmm. But you saw a lot of the Well, the, the well they did because, I mean, you had the, the new, new guard and right. guard coming in. And they really yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. It took them a while to settle, but they were they were really banging heads. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they seem to have. But I, I agree with you, Mike. I think that uh, some of the pushback, I mean, they, you know, this will go into the bike lane that, that showed mm-hmm. up. Uh, they didn't know about that. They didn't know about the recent firing of Chief Scott Baker. Yeah. Um, and uh, I get that they maybe don't need to know about it, yeah. or, or maybe they're not required to know about mm-hmm. it, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But that's just sort of a, it just seems like, hey, you know, we're making a major change in the way yeah. we police our city. I want to let you know why mm-hmm. we're doing this. And, you know, you don't have to release it to the public. I get that. Yeah. Or letting everybody know at the same time. So I'll, I'll come to Gavin's defense in this situation. When you tell everybody, you almost have to do it through a press release. Because I went through this experience. So say you're going to call the alderman and you start with Ward 1. By the time you get to Ward 4 or 5, the alderman and Ward 8 already knows. And the paper already knows. So you have to strategically say, okay, I'm emailing you all at the same time. I'll talk to the paper in several hours. But, you know, also, I mean, the fire of police chief on vacation by phone. I mean, come on. That's not exactly the best well, way. I, you know, and it, then I'll have a beer with him when he gets back. I'm like, I don't think yeah, he wants that. I, I'll, I'll, <laughs> you know? I'll defend that. From what I understand, that Teresa had fired him in person. Oh. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, Gavin didn't actually do it because I think Gavin is not able to fire somebody mm-hmm. technically by code. It has to be the city manager. Correct. So Correct. I think Teresa did fire him in person. And he said, well, I got to go on vacation anyway. So I'll okay. sort of deal with this later. But the news broke when he was in St. Thomas. So right. we'll blame the Capitol for that. Then. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know. we can't get police chiefs to come on in, on interviews anymore. Every time we interview a police chief, they get fired. I just, <laughs> yeah, Kevin Davis, mm-hmm. fired, mm-hmm. boom, mm-hmm. out of there. Mike Pristu, boom, gone, out of yeah. there. Well, I think that's the one thing. The situation's different when you see the pushback. Is you know, crime was at a high, you know, I don't want to say a record high, but the murders were definitely higher than they had been before. And so, you know, we made a change in leadership and under Baker, it had come down to record lows. So people were trying to understand, well, why was Baker fired? You know, I think Fred said it best. He's like, you want a new vision, a new direction. Like, what is it? You know, yeah. what if the community policing, they did, what was it, 700 events? You know, they're doing 872. community policing. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. And, and again, to sit there and, and hang, and, and I don't think it was necessarily very fair to hang in on Mike Pristube, mm-hmm. the, the amount of murders. And I mean, you know, the... Police chief is not necessarily the cause. Right. Of these and murders. we said at the time, too, that things there. I mean, and, and it was such a small city that small numbers. And we're dealing with 10 murders. Right. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden we have nine men. I cut it 10%. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. You know it makes it real easy. Um, but it's, uh, it's yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, there's been a lot of strange, uh, I don't know, acceptance of what I mean. The council has done some good things. I think the, you know, the, the, the tree huggers, I think the no net loss yeah. uh, is, is good. I think they stumbled in, in doing it. They realized they did when Crystal Spring or uh, came through and said, hey, we, here's our loophole. And they, they, they're trying to close yeah. it up a little bit. You know, the bike lane, I think, was a huge misstep. And, um, I, you know, I think there's things that you had in place, oh. Main Street rebricking and the Public Works Building are the, the two things that are you know, costing yeah. The city money at this point. So if we can go to the bike lane real quick, um, I know it's everybody's favorite topic. Did you bike here today? No, I did not. <laughs> but I did bike to work every day, and I'll tell you the story about the electric bike. Um, I did when I did bike to mayor, which is amazing. If you've never been right. on an electric bike. Yeah. It's basically like uh, you pedal, but there's like a motor that helps you go uphill. Oh, lazy biking. That's it great. is yeah. actually it's great. I, want, I, want, I bet you Alex Plano's head will explode if we talk to him about this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's talk about it with them. Uh-huh. They're electric charged. Yep. Except when you go downhill, you go really fast and it's kind of hard to slow down. So, But with the bike lane, I mean, I remember talking to Ross about it. And uh, 
they had a discussion the last budget. The mayor said, I'd like to have money to redo or to do a bike lane, right? And they said, you know, Gavin, no, we're not going to do it. We understand you want to postpone it. You can have money to study it or redesign it. And he goes, I understand. I hear you. I respect your opinion. But then he did it anyway. Right? And it's kind of the same thing with the music festival. I remember I think Sheila looked at him and said, you know, where is this money going to? Who's paying for it? Are we on the hook with liabilities? And, you know, give Gavin credit. He always does it with a smile and is nice. He goes, I hear you. I respect your opinion, but we're going to do it anyway. And they just all kind of nodded and were like, okay. Yeah. And well, it, I was like, if I did that, man, I'd be out in the street. Well, the, the problem with the bike lane, and we told him this, we said it was, it was just very clumsily executed and poorly defended. You know, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't defend an idea and a concept that you kind of ran down everyone's throats on the Eastport Forum by, you know, having employees, government employees, yeah, yeah. city employees yelling at people on, on the mm -hmm. forum. It was just, it was a very bad idea. Yeah. And, you know, he lost the business community, which was a lot of the people who, who were behind him yeah. in the beginning, and he lost pretty much everyone with that. Well, That's he never told him, and that was his whole thing, is we're going to bring the community together, right. and then a week before you're going to do it. But I think the thing that really cost him at the end is... People are forgiving, even in this right. town. You know, if you would have come and said, look, I, I ran on a platform of change, I made a mistake, I should have had a public hearing. But when you guys interviewed him before with Alex Blind, he was like, I don't regret doing it. I'm glad we did it. And we still have, like, he just doubled yeah. down well, on in it. His yeah. defense, and then it came up. <laughs> right, right. It came up a couple times. But in his right. defense, I, I believe in taking risks. I, you know, calculated yeah. risks and trying things and failing and trying again. I know that's a little difficult when you're running mm -hmm. government. But that said, you. You can do those things, but you really have to make sure that yeah. you couch that carefully. You know, I mean, you're always going to have people ticked off at you no matter what. Yeah, I mean, but you just have to be careful. And it was just clumsy in the execution. It was clumsy on withdrawal, and that that's where it got. And what what it cost the city. And the point I try to make to the paper, and what I said, I don't think it's legal. Is this the council gets together as a whole? We vote on a capital budget, and everybody says, like, I want to do a road in Eastport or Ward Two or Ward Six, wherever it is. Right? And the council comes together and they vote on a budget, and that's implemented. For the mayor to go in and say, you know what, I'm going to pull money away from other projects, whether it's Ward 4, Ward 2, Ward 1, and spend it on a bike lane. The money had to come from somewhere. I don't think that's legal in the capital budget. He can unilaterally do it. Because if he does, what's the point of having a budget? If we all agree, here's our top 10 public works priorities, and he says, I'm going to put a, a pedestrian bridge over Forest Drive, I'm going to put bocce ball court, and I'm going to reallocate the money, why even vote on a budget? And the paper and the council never really, I guess, kind of push that argument they were like well the mayor administratively and the city manager can do it which i mean i guess if nobody complains you can do it i don't know I, it's I, like nixon um if you saw the movie frost and nixon yeah. and um i think Teresa said at one time you know the quote i'm talking about right they were asking richard nixon about watergate and everything it's not illegal right? if the president yeah, he does goes, it well it's not illegal if the president does it that's right. kind of the answer right. they get like well it's not illegal if the mayor does it <laughs> so yeah, well, it's, uh, I mean, I get, I get it. If, if he wants to put in a, a couple of bike racks and yeah, find, yeah. find a couple of couple thousand bucks to do that, or or to deflect, you know, some maybe some curb repair from this week, mm -hmm, maybe mm -hmm. push it off for a month to do a, a pet project, or somebody's making a lot of noise. I mean, I, I get that. There's political reasons and there's a political capital to have there. I this, will say this, this is just crazy. It was. Uh, I was in Manhattan over the weekend, and I think like the bike share up there. I think yeah. you sign up for like a. 100 bucks a month or something like that, and you have hmm. unlimited bike usage. I, I'm not a biker. I'm not a bit. It, that was unbelievable how that city now relies on that program. So mm -hmm. I kind of see where he's going with the bike share thing, yeah. which I don't think is taken off because I don't think anyone understands it. But when I saw it in, in operation, and a little bit in D.C., but especially Manhattan, I was wildly impressed. I think the, the demographics kind of changed, though. I mean, because we were at the community meeting. Um, about the old public works building we talked about a little before right, we got on, on here on spa road and he said you know look at denmark half the people commute and in a very dense urban city that makes sense but i would clearly say that i mean if i asked you how many people actually live in annapolis and work in annapolis right i'd say less than 70 percent. i mean oh, most yeah. people work in baltimore dc they work in the mm -hmm. county so it's not realistic for them to bite to work living in the city well my argument too and i've had this argument with alex Pine and a couple other people is that we're not a we're not a European city. We're not built mm -hmm. like a European mm -hmm. city in so much as um, we're part of a major metropolitan area. It's um, you know we, we were built with an infrastructure from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not built that way. I, and I, and, and I mean, we don't have the population to support it. You talk about Manhattan. I mean, yeah. it's got you know how many uh, what, 20 million hundreds of people. You know, 20 million people in in there mm -hmm. that work within there. Thousands. It's, it's yeah. able to to do that mm -hmm. um, here. Not again, as you said, not so yeah. much. Very few do, and I mean the area that is condensed that probably could use a bicycle infrastructure is 
probably the historic section where everything right. is really very tight. But again, it's so small that it doesn't. So I mean, I think what we're relegated to, as opposed to a commuting type of a biking infrastructure, is more of a recreational biking infrastructure. And we had that the original. Uh, bike racks down by the market house we installed them and did a ribbon cutting so i think some people were like the city hated bicycles before that wasn't the case even before i was mayor outside of the garages they had the artistic bike racks like you know, mm-hmm. we had done it just not to the degree of the bike lane right um well it's interesting to see how that goes I mean, and again the, the biking uh study that they did mm-hmm. is is very valid but it did not you know, anywhere I looked at it, it didn't include a, a wrong way bike lane down Main Street. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, if, if it was up Main Street, it's fine. But I think that the critical part, and I think you can probably agree with this, is we'd love to get the cars off the city dock. I think mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's, you. everybody thinks the same thing. I hate biking in general. And Sorry, I think, Alex, um, I do. You know, and, and whether we have a parking problem or it's perceived, and I do believe it's perceived for the most part, mm-hmm. um, you know, Hillman needs to be addressed. Yeah. And that's, you know, and, and I think that that is the key, personally, to solving, I don't say all the problems, but you build Hillman, you expand it a little bit. I mean, new technology has been there, the way they can, you know, I, I know this garage right here near her night, and you can park on the ramps. Hillman doesn't, mm-hmm. Hillman's got dedicated ramps that go yeah, up. Yeah. But this one has wider ramps and you've got cars that, that line it. Um, that, makes, that makes sense. So you can probably increase the capacity, get rid of the cars on city dock, and then once you've got rid of them, then you can dig it up and plant grasses or splash parks or whatever else may want to go in there. I think that's one of the things that kind of got taken away during the campaign, and I'll take responsibility for not articulating it well enough, which was, you know, what the plan and the vision was for downtown. So when I came in, I said, look, what do we have to do downtown from an infrastructure point to turn it around? And I can look back at a number of successes. So the three infrastructure projects were the bulkhead downtown. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, if you look down at the Alex Haley Memorial, all the concrete physical bulkheads, what they call it. I mean, the concrete was falling in the water, it was terrible. So we rebuilt that on schedule and a million dollars under budget. Then I said, what's the next piece See, of- See, now if Donald Trump was our mayor, it would have been a big wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. we would have solved all the- <laughs> Speaking of how- well, they, just, you know, it's actually just like, like would have paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually like, I think 50 or 65 feet deep. I mean, it's a massive, massive bulkhead underground yes, yeah. versus the top. I remember, um, I remember they were monitoring uh, the seismic activity oh, when yeah, they yeah. were drilling the piles for the historic buildings to see whether they would fall down. It shakes. And, and so that was number one. So we did the bulkhead great success. Number two was Main Street. And not to bring up the bike lane again, but construction was supposed to start on Main Street in February. It would have been done. Everything was paid for. And the mayor decided to push it off, which, you know, like... Um, the old Fawcett's building, mayors have a right to come in and change the way we do things. We'll talk about the cost of his vision later. The third one was the Hillman Garage. And so my whole thing was, you know, we're not against putting parking downtown, but you have to fix the parking problem first. And so we did a number of things, you know. We passed legislation so private people can rent their parking spaces to the public. So if you're coming down here, what happens at five o'clock? All the businesses leave, right? All those spots are open, but no one's using it. So there's a lot of um, private parking on lots that you can now do. You just pay for it. You know, the businesses make money, the residents have a place to park. So I was trying to find, trying to work with the school system at Green Street to use that after hours. So my whole thing was, look, you rebuild Hillman Garage, then you can do the park downtown. But I think you can't do it out of order. And I think that's one of the frustrations people have is, you know, it's, there was an article that came out about the record level of flooding. And then the very next day, it was like, we're going to put bocce ball. And it's like, what's the point of doing that if it's just going to flood? Like, it's not all parties. You have to figure, let's fix flooding, and then we can do all those other things. And so if you look at it, those were all put out. But to go back to the cost, um, and I asked the captain and other people, I said, what is the cost of the vision? So for example, I hired an engineer, an architect. I said, we're going to redo Main Street, right? I pay them money, they come in, they redesign, ready to start construction. I now come back and say, I don't like that plan. I want sidewalk cafes, I want you to re-engineer the tables and everything else. The engineer's either gonna say, no problem, I'll do it for free, or say, you gotta pay me again to redo it. Same thing with flooding downtown, which I'm very concerned about. We had money for flood mitigation from Governor Hogan to work to design it. Those plans had to get redrawn for the underground parking garage, the Hall of Fame. Now that's not there, so we have to redraw it again. Or the public works building, you know, that's $4.5 million. Is an architect or engineer gonna say, oh, we'll do a whole new building for free? So you add up all of these costs and changes, there's a dollar amount to it that nobody really understands or knows about. 
Can I interrupt real sure. quick? You just mentioned something that just triggered me. You said uh, you had money from Governor Hogan. Mm -hmm. And we've the city has had a substandard, what is it, three hundred and seventy sixty seven thousand sixty seven thousand sure, yeah, yeah. dollars for decades, which has been a bargain for the state. Um, sure. and we didn't get it this year. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight onto that as to why that might don't know. But if anything, it actually kind of worked out um, in the city's favor because once it was taken away, we ended up getting more money. That, that's true. The but, long term. but you know, for the first, well, we're not going to get it this year, and next year we'll cover last year and and this year and, the, and this and year. So yeah. or next year and this year. So I didn't know whether there was any insight as to why. Now, did you have to request that every year? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think the only thing that I don't remember want to speak for the governor was something about um, mandated spending, which you see at the state level they always put in. You have to spend money on this, and that's kind of was one of his things in the campaign is. You know, not always mandating more funding, but you know, in addition, so we always got the 367. Is we got the million dollars for flooding. He doubled our safe streets money. So, when you would ask for things that you need them, the governor was always very receptive because he lives here. You know, right. it's like I told all the people. I said, look, when I speak to the legislature, I'm like, I'm your mayor for the next 90 days. You know, he, li he lives in public housing in the city. <laughs> yeah. Let's, to be honest with you, I never thought of it that way. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> when we talked to him, we joked. He says, Yeah, I, actually, I do. <laughs> it's, it's nice. <laughs> so looking at that, and we always we always do this whenever we talk about Annapolis, and we always end up with the downtown with Ward One, mm -hmm. and I always say this with with every mayor that I've seen come through, saying, you know, I think the difficulty is looking beyond Ward One because mm -hmm. they're the obvious child, and that's where the tourists are, that's yeah. where a lot a lot of the business are, but the vast majority are not. Uh, so when we just mentioned and said, you know, a pedestrian bridge over Forest Drive mm -hmm. where, you know, people joke about that. But I mean, I, I think it'd be a great idea because if you go, if you go down Forest Drive, and I know that's kind of a mix of state and county and, mm -hmm. and city and that's kind of a mess. But I think I hear that from a lot of people outside of Ward 1, you know, here in Ward 8, which are, you know, they'll complain, but they're kind of Ward 1's middle child. So <laughs> they get a lot of attention, too. But what about the wards that, that don't traditionally get the attention and they because a lot of votes don't come out of those wards. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that's because that's not why they get it, but you know, four it comes well, to mind, know, three, you know, five, and seven come to mind. I right. mean, they, yeah. they tend to be, I mean, well, they're 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 better communities for the most part, and um, you know, they're they're not there, they're not they're not making the noise. I mean, yeah. and that's always been my issue is that, and I know, and I would even look at the at the city council, even the people who represent those wards still mm -hmm. look at downtown, yeah. Uh, issues, you know, instead, instead of saying, and not all, not all the time, but saying, like, you know, let's let's look what we can do in other parts of the city because there are there other parts of the city that really do need attention. Yeah, uh, I, I always say that it's never more evident to me the differences until you see plowing mm -hmm. and you see, you know, sidewalks. You know, mm -hmm. and, and not to, I'm going to say it, the <laughs> Saint the Saint Mary's sidewalks mm -hmm. are leading us. They're pristine and they're shoveled and everything. And that always that always amazed me in the winter. And the kids in Annapolis Middle. When we get a big snow, the midshipman action group goes into into full force shoveling the sidewalks of Ward One. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they live down there, and um, you know Ted Levitt will give me free donuts, and I will take it out to them. So it was. I good, miss yeah. Ted Levitt. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. He, you said I think he was your most listened to podcast. He was at one point. Yeah, he was. Yeah. That was uh, it. Was a lot of fun. He's enjoying his retirement. That's for sure. And yeah. then, uh, his dog Maddie and his yeah. uh, and his uh, Beth doing a lot of traveling and everything else. Food. Levitt was down at the, um, at the market house at one one of the iterations of the market house. Right, right, he right. had his thing. What's what are your thoughts on the market house? So, you know, th I mean, you had your own iteration. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. Um, rather inherited though, in the terms of you know the lease went through my entire term. So, you know, you obviously saw the posts I did on Facebook. Overall, I think the food's good. I encourage people to go down there. I think it's going well. My concern was the deal that the city got and kind of, you know, how it was um, rolled out. So, for example, the one thing, and I, I try to document everything. I know I sent you guys a lot of emails. Mm -hmm. Is Gavin said something like, we finally have a profitable market house that is, you know, thriving and making money for the city. And I'm like, you didn't pay any rent this year, you know, and it was right. closed after easy. the lip. You know, how's it how's far? But I mean, if you think about it, you know, I believe in 2003, they were paying somewhere around $30 a square foot. And then now they're paying $18 a square foot. So I think people's concern was, you know, the mayor's business partner got this, you know, he's paying half of what people paid in the past. They paid no rent this year. And that was actually my favorite part of watching city council is the way they poach it. They're like, you know, it's better for our cash flow and for our business plan if we don't pay rent this year. And they're like, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm like, what? 
what about the city's cash flow? And then they got a liquor license. So, you know, you know, my thought is, I like the layout. I think the food's good. I just think it's concerning when they're closing a few days because you're not paying any rent, you have a liquor license, and you can't stay open seven days a week. That, that's a big concern for me moving forward. Well, I think that it's, uh, yeah, there's certain issues there. I mean, and, and they opened late. I get, I get they opened in August, but um, as, as with anything, I know I've had one restaurateur told me that, you know, in the dead of February, he'd pay me to eat in his restaurant if I'd sit in the window. And I get you by my booze if I smiled and looked like I was <laughs> enjoying the meal. Yeah. And and winter is tough for any business sure. in Annapolis. We don't have the tourist trade that we do. Uh, Annapolis is not downtown. Annapolis is not overly well supported by the people that live in those mm-hmm. outlying wards. I mean, there's not people that are flooding there. They are like it or not going to town center. They're going to the mall. Mm-hmm. They're going to you know shop at Growls. Right. Um, and I, I, that's that's a real concern of mine. You know. Can they can they survive? I mean, there's there's I a lot think of. I over- they can. The last tenant survived, and you know, over the history, of the market house has been turbulent, but people have always found a way to make money. I think. Yeah, but it's they- always been it's always been heavily subsidized. Sure. Oh, I, matter of fact, I don't. I, I'm going to say that I don't think you can have a business in the market house and not have it subsidized at this point. I don't know how the previous vendors did that before 2003 because I mean and sometimes I wonder if we were waxing nostalgic about that like everything was like oh it's awesome it was great then I wonder was it as good as we remembered I mean I I don't know if it was you said that I was kind of dungy but that was a charm you know I don't know know. you know what I hear people say that about Times Square too Mm -hmm. (laughs) I said now it's all sanitized it's like you know it's like Disneyland I'm like do you remember what it was like before it was pretty shitty (laughs) Times Square was pretty lousy so maybe maybe we're not romanticizing it but I wonder how come the, the individual vendors were profitable then, but I just don't like, and I'll give every mayor from after Moyer mm-hmm. a, a pass on this because I think they inherited an incredibly bad decision yeah. on every possible level. And I would love to do a three hour podcast about why that was such a bad decision in 2000. You can have me on and I can tell you <laughs> the history of it. But so every mayor since then, I'll kind of give yeah, them yeah, a pass yeah. because you, you were given a, a white elephant and say, all right, fix this. And you're like, well, what the hell am I going to do with it? Because I, I understand why the business owners and the restaurant tours downtown are pissed because they're competing with some with, with business that doesn't pay full rent and has a liquor license. And so I would be pissed if I were them yeah. too. On the other hand, I, I don't know how you can make any sort of money in that place without a subsidy. So I'm kind well, of Well, it's an interesting thing. Um, I'll get you the subsidy about what the other businesses are getting out of it. I was talking with a local business owner. We were talking about the market house. I won't say who it was, and they were you know, complaining about it. I said, what's, you know, he's like, you want to know the real benefit? He's like, you want to know the real impact downtown? I was like, what is it? He goes, it's lowering all of our taxes. I'm like, what do you mean? And he told me, like, there's a lot of business people downtown that have appealed their property taxes based on the $18 a square foot. So residential housing, you go in there and you say, all right, my house is four or $500,000, here's what my neighbors pay, and you can appeal it. So I know for a fact, uh, you should talk to the guy from Storm Brothers, I know he's done it, a number of the other businesses have lowered their property taxes because of the market house, because it's a formula. I you did come, not know that. You should research that it. That is the fascinating. The capital should too. That's it. so interesting, so that's like sort of like having a... Yeah. Uh, so what's the cost? This, now the taxpayers are doing it. Because you go in there and you say, well, my neighbor's paying $18 a square foot. This is what my uh, property tax should be. Wow. I'll talk to you guys offline after this. <laughs> <mention>. Names <laughs> well, tell you who's making out. Interesting. Interesting aspect. But, what, but that, that goes back to what's the cost of it. And just the last thing on the market house and the closing date, if somebody goes somewhere and it's closed, that's all you're going to remember. So if I went down there on a Tuesday and it was closed, and I'm like, oh, I kind of want to go somewhere to eat. Someone says the market house. like, no, nah, I went down there. I think it's closed. Yeah. You know? No, no, unless you're, unless you're looking for the sign and, and make a mental note. Right, right, right. It's, it's not. It's, but I will say the food is very good. I went down there and saw a Jody. I'm like, what do you recommend? I had like the tuna bowl. It was delicious. So people should go down there. The food, the food, the food is good. We've been there, been there. Yeah. I, I, do, I do like the iteration. I like the fact that they're serving beer. I think that's. Uh, I think we didn't have like the shishi beer, though. I just want a more light. I don't I mean, everything With else. With all the corn syrup in it. <laughs> I like my corn syrup. It's... You watched the Bud Light commercial, I too. I did. <laughs> they, they, mm-hmm. um, and you know, I ran into to the mayor a couple of days ago, and I, I was I said, you know, you, you may not know it, but you're in an election. Uh, you, you know, it's not your season yet, but you are. And I said, yeah. you got to get something going because right now all you got to hang your hat on is uh, the bike lane and a tax increase, which is not resonating very well with anybody. Yeah. Um, and you held the line on taxes. I mean, obviously the mayor has spoken out uh, against you as far as increasing the uh, unfunded liabilities in lieu of 
holding the line on taxes and this, you know, made the argument successfully, obviously, mm-hmm. that we needed to raise the taxes. Where do you where do you stand on that? So when the next budget comes along, I'm going to go down to City Hall and just completely destroy that fallacy and that argument. Um, basically, you're, you're sit next to Robert Eads and the two you're going to heckle. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you look at it, it's basically people think they have to do it. And if it's in your mindset, you know, my predecessor raised taxes, you know, Mayor Buckley raised taxes because they wanted to raise taxes. Right? It's not a necessity. So you talk about unfunded liabilities. You know, you just look at the facts. And I sent that to the paper. I said pension contributions went from 9% to 18% under my watch. Right? I doubled what the city pays for people's pensions. Gavin's went from 18 to 22. So not to bore people with math, that's an 11% increase. So even if Gavin raises it 11% every year, that's still not as much as what I did. Right? And so he's kind of playing, well, the pension is not fully funded. Well, look at pensions across America. There's no pension None that's, fully, that's funded. fully funded. Right, right. And then adding to your staff and everything only makes the contribution greater. So if, if you look at it, I, I don't believe we had to raise taxes. And I think, I wish I was a fly on the wall when they had the budget hearings. Because, you know, when I came in my first budget, they said, you have a $7.5 million structural deficit. I had to work my way out of it. Ten days before my election. They signed a collective bargaining agreement that said all city employees get a 10% pay increase. Well, if you know anything about city government, the number one cost you have is salary and benefits. So here I come in, right? I didn't know. I had a $7.5 million shortfall. I had to come up with a 10% increase, the doubling of the contributions to the pension fund. So I was kind of dealt a bad hand, if you will. Gavin had lots of advice. You know, Jared Littman was consulting him, all the past mayor. So for him to come in here, and he even had press conference with the Democrats, like, oh, the budget's terrible, and say, well, we have to raise taxes. I can show you, by the numbers, you didn't have to raise the taxes. And I'm working on a project now. If you look at the percentage basis that the budget's gone up under Ellen Moyer, Cohen, and everything else, versus the county or the state, it's vastly different. I mean, think about it. Why is it Annapolis every single year has to raise taxes and Anne Arundel County never raises taxes? It's because they have a tax cap. Right. So if your expenses are only going up 2% every year, when you have to cut, it's not that difficult. But when you don't have a tax cap and you're bringing in vast sums of revenue, I mean, their budget doubled in eight years. So the thing I wrote about it is I said, look, imagine if your personal budget doubled in eight years and you were still broke. You have a spending problem. And you know when you look at the budget and say, well, you know, we don't have any money, and the first thing you do is say, well, we'll give the city manager a $40,000 increase, or we'll hire an arts liaison, or we'll hire a city poet, right? Or we're going to put on a music festival or do a bike lane, right? Those were all part of the tax increase that weren't part of the conversation, you know? And I give the council a lot of credit for pushing back because Gavin, in a smart way, his tax increase was so big, it was really like four years of tax increases into one. So he figured, I'm going to bite the bullet do the largest tax increase in recorded city history. And hope, hope they forget about it. And hope it. they forget <laughs> about it, right? Instead of doing like a 5%, 10% every year. And the council was like, this is ridiculous. I mean, you talk to people, I think you had Sean O'Neill's bill went up $1,000. And people say, what'd you get for it? I got a 30-day bike lane. So this whole <laughs> myth about, oh, I didn't fund the pensions, I doubled the pension contributions. And that's better than his 11% this year. So, you know, if he wants to get into it, and I think if you look at what I've done, you haven't seen me speak at every council meeting or write lots of op-eds, but I don't let people say things that are completely false about me and get away with it. You know, I'll let things slide off and roll, but when you say, oh, I never funded the pension, or the other one is downtown, that's actually the one that really like gets me angry. They're like, you had no vision, nothing happened downtown. Four years, you, can't, you don't have a single accomplishment. So if we're in an editorial board meeting or debate or we're talking to someone like, How, what do you base that on? I said. I can look downtown and point to specific success stories. So redoing the bulkhead at, you know, uh, on schedule and a million dollars under budget. Paying for parking by telephone makes it easier for people to park. You know, the circulator you can find with an app now to make it more reliable. The faucets building got done. I'm the only mayor in the last 20 years to have the market house open every day and making money. You had a pocket park sitting vacant forever. Now there's a building that went in there, you know, there's a mission barbecue. Yeah. There's a Mission Barbecue where the Stevens Hardware Store was. You know, the old rec center has life to it. You know, my plan was to get rid of vacant buildings. So I could look, plan to redo Main Street and say, here's all the successes I had. And I think from Gavin's point of view, you know, and I'll come to his defense, a lot of people give him grief. You can't expect him to, you know, completely redo Hillman in a year or downtown. But I think what the capital needs to do in the public is hold him accountable. So four years from now, 
if Hillman Garage is not under construction, if flooding is not, if the flood mitigation plan is not being worked on, if there's no green space downtown, what do you base it on? Like you said, you know, you ended the Main Street project, you had a bike lane. What other successes have happened downtown? And part of the debate is we tried to highlight that, but it wasn't necessarily about, you know, facts and accomplishments. It was sometimes about style and the big vision. People were like, oh, I love this vision. I'm like, well, what is it? I mean, if there's, not oh, a, I, I, if, if there's not a damn Ferris wheel by the end of the term, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of doubled down your last debate, though. Remember, he said... Uh, you know, he, he was so serious about that. And, and it, it, it goes back and forth as to whether... And, and you and Tim and I have had this argument. Say this. I'm a pretty reasonable person. That was a real deal. It was, it was not... dead serious. Now, I don't know that he was planning on purchasing it but, or renting it <laughs> or something, but he's going to do it and try it. I, 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 I do love that he's got ideas. Yeah, no, we all like it. But so go back to the, the Ferris wheel. He's, he's, he called us the next day. He goes, I'm going to talk to you despite the fact you two almost cost me the election. <laughs> yeah, that was the one thing that I would actually call a lie because we went through and I don't want to bat mouth the paper because, you know. They don't like he, us he, he very sound, much. You sound salty. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't blame him for not liking you guys. I mean, think about no, it for I a second. Either. You have something like 100,000 social media followers on the on Apple. Mm-hmm. So I think they're at like 20,000. You have five times as many. And if you look at the comments, you guys are beating them on social media. So clearly, and you're breaking news before them well, we, sometimes. We like them. Yeah. yeah. We like them. Yeah, I like the comments. But, yeah. but if you go back to it, and I, I try to tell them, I said he was serious. You look back at a podcast he had with Scott McMullen. In 2015, he talked about doing a Ferris wheel downtown in detail. Now, granted, it was on St. John's campus. He wanted to do a big festival. We have a Ferris wheel. It'd be great. Right. So he's talking about it in 2015. He talked about it on your guys' cast, and the paper just said the joke. They didn't quote everything else you said about, well, it could be two years, pay with concessions. And then at the debate, I called him. I said, you know, if the Ferris wheel is a joke, is the um, carousel a joke, the ice skating rink? He's like, they're all ideas. They're all right. on the table. They've all been out there. And then the last one you had was- What about the bike lane? Is that it? <laughs> yeah, right. And then he said, the last one he said, he's like, well, I said I wouldn't buy one. I never said I wouldn't rent one. Right. And I mean, so my thing is, the paper kind of covered for him. He backpedaled. He was serious. I mean, own up to it. We all say things we regret. I but. will say this. You just brought up the debate. It was interesting to me. We mentioned this a few times after that. The two of you had more debates than I remember any in, in, in any mayoral election. Mm-hmm. And it got to the point that you guys were almost in a rhythm with each other. <laughs> like, like you were like a traveling show. You know, It was never nasty. It was never any of that. Mm-hmm. But it's sort of like wherever you guys showed up, Like I saw you guys like pause a couple times because you know the other person was going to jump in with their point. And I'm like... They know each other right now better than they know anyone else in their lives. It was always funny and they, to watch and they it. had lunch the, the day before the election or something, didn't you? Um, or a couple days before the election. Yeah, I think it was like a, 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 yeah, a couple days or a week. Over yeah. at Lemongrass. But um, what do you think about City Dock Hotel? The, I, the Hotel Blonder. Yeah, I mean, so look, pe- people... Blonder or Blonder? Uh, you said that. Um, <laughs> so I think the idea of having a small boutique hotel is a good thing downtown. I mean, I think it's fine with four stories. I think the idea of having a seven-story hotel doesn't work. Um, so to go into the details a little bit of it, think about what happened with the historic district, right? And going back to the legislation he introduced. One of the things I think that happens is at a local level, big things come up and we forget what we were just talking about. And so I'll explain, you know, he had the biggest tax increase in the city history. And then all of a sudden we talked about his uh, legislation on the historic district. Then all of a sudden we talked about the bike lane. Then all of a sudden we're talking about firing the police chief. But that legislation and history kind of for your readers, Annapolis was the first city in the country to vote in our own historic district. Basically what happened is the Marriott came downtown, you know, big six-story building down there, and the plan was to do Marriott's all along downtown, which if you ask anybody would have destroyed our historic district, you know, what what makes Annapolis special. So the citizens voted in the historic district, and the main thing about the historic district is size and bulk, how big you can build something. That's really the main part of it. So his legislation would have got rid of all the height and bulk restrictions. So when he says something like, well, I support a four-story hotel, not a seven-story hotel, then why would you introduce legislation that would let it be seven stories? Why not introduce legislation that would let it be four? Well, one thing that was frustrating to me is that he addressed when we were have they had a, a charrette, which is a word I discovered under Ellen Moyer's thing. I never <laughs> heard that word before, but for the traffic signal that they were proposing, which is now off the table at Randall Street. But, um, oh, that's off the table? Yeah. yeah, I, didn't know yeah I actually yeah. wanted to do it. I was talking to friends in the construction industry, builders that I know, and I was like, how much would you charge for a traffic circle? They're like, I mean, $100,000 at the most. I'm like, it's not 
400, 500,000. He's like, you're a yeah, sucker yeah. if you're paying that. There's some other infrastructure that needs to be done there with the, with the adjacent light. But, you know, he, he said at that meeting, he said, oh, well, somebody questioned him about what about this seven story hotel and how is the traffic going to impact that? And he says, well, first of all, I've never been in support of any kind of hotel down on the city dock. Mm-hmm. And everyone in the room was like, what? You know, uh, so he did backtrack on yeah. that a little bit. I mean, I, I I agree. I think something small there that is a very challenging yeah. spot for anything to work. We've had how many? Everybody's everybody's failed there. Um, but but to go back to the hotel and the historic district. Too. <laughs> but no one cares about that part. I mean, yeah. we've had we've had nine thousand restaurants down there, none of them work. But to think about um, the historic district and everything else. You know, again, like I said, that legislation would have completely got rid of the size and bulk. So you could have had that. And now people are just talking about, you know, the Urban Land Institute. But that was, I mean, record like a record legislation. So I was always very analytical on how I did things. So when people talked about a seven story hotel and underground parking, I said, you know, that doesn't make sense for the city because you're not adding parking. Right. So think about it like this. You have a hotel that has um, 200 rooms in it. Right you're gonna account for 200 parking spots. Realistically, probably more with staff and everyone else. Not to mention you're getting rid of 100 spots on top. So now, if you build a 300 unit underground parking garage and you have 200 for the hotel and 100 that you're taking off top, you didn't add any parking. You're still, so you spent, you're still losing 50. Right, you're still losing 50, even if it's 400. And then I did the math and it was like $400,000 a parking spot. And you're like, is it worth $400,000 to the city to have underground parking where it's gonna flood and subsidize a private business? I'm like, we looked at it, engineering wise, you can't do it. Or, I mean, you could do it at an exorbitant cost that the taxpayers sure. would have to subsidize. Yeah, so have huge pumps and yeah. 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 But that, that goes back to like the bocce ball thing, which is, you know, we got money from the governor to do flood mitigation. We started it. I guess it got redesigned or put on hold. And the response is we're going to do bocce ball, not like I'm going to find more federal money. And so I think, you know, we have to think about what is going to happen four years from now. All right, this is a genuine question. But sure. I know that one of the – this is to both of you when you're listening to the campaign promises. We were talking about what are they called grant ninjas. The, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. do we are we finding more grants? Are we I, I, utilizing I, I grants? Not, or? I have not seen necessarily. I mean, there's been a few here and there. I know that the actually it was I mean, downtown question. I don't know. got a uh, Sharrow grant from. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like a weird thing. It was like ice cream company or something like that to paint bike arrows on the pavement. Yeah, I saw that. Well, we had the 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 pace bike grant. We had applied for some federal grants. I'm not sure if they came through, but that's a good point you mentioned about campaign promises and grant writing ninjas because. When the whole thing came out about the tax increase, when he's like, I never had a read my lip moment, I did most of the research for the Capitol. And I was like, are you going to call them out for lying about not raising taxes? And they're like, well, you know, what proof? And I'm like, OK. So I dug through for like three hours online, got his questionnaire about it, found a social media post. I'm like, here's a link to all the debates. Thank you, John. And I'm like, here's what he said. Oh, I'm going to put my businesses in a blind trust on multiple occasions. Has he done it? Maybe he has. I'm going to do the sanctuary city thing. Has he done it? You know, there's a number of whole open door sessions like I did. You can go through the list of all the things you promised, the east-west flyer, a free trolley. And I think that was part of the campaign, too. People believed in this big thing. So when you come out there, there's one great debate. I think it was the one you guys did. He's talking about taxes. He's like, oh, taxes are too high. We got to talk about lowering them. Right. So you got this guy out there who's like, hey, we got to talk about lowering your taxes. We're going to have free bike lanes, free trolley, and East West Flyer, free ferries, and I'm not gonna raise your taxes. Like people are like, this is great. Right. In reality, it's like right. no. Right, right. the your one question that wasn't asked yeah, was yeah, how. Yeah, yeah. It was how. Well, I'll tell you, it sounds like, um, I mean, I think you've got some valid concerns, some valid, cons- oh, yeah. you know, some criticism there. I think uh, everybody, as we go into election season, probably does as well. And I think they're all gonna be asking those questions. You know, yeah. what, where do we have? I mean, again, same type of a thing. It's are we any better off this this year than we were four years ago? Mm-hmm. Is sort of the general guiding principle there. Yeah. Um, and those questions that people ask, are they going to be asking them of you too? Or are you going to be on the debate stage again? <laughs> um, I talked about it. So I'm definitely going to run for public service again. I really enjoy it. I think I do a good job. Let me just say this: you seem more relaxed. Yeah, like yeah, that it's, when it's you're, great. When you get the you're weight lifted that's, off your yeah. shoulder. Um, Got that whole losing thing down so far, so we, you know, we got that out of the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, <laughs> um, when you lose an election, it's sort of like you know they, they always said that when you're when you're home and you were just. 
put it right in your hair and everything because then you don't care, right? Yeah. Now, you're like, screw it. Let's, let's talk real. Yeah. So, you know, I talk to my wife about it. You know, definitely going to run for something. Not sure if I'm going to run for mayor. You know, I love this city, but there's probably a different office I'd do. Would you be, a, I mean, then you would, would you get potentially two terms if you were to re run and get reelected? Mm, do you know? I don't I know. If it's still current. one. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think it matters. I think it's total. Um, but the other thing is, I don't know how to say it without coming across salty. Go ahead. It's, it's like, the thing about it like this, whoever's taken off, whoever's going to be governor after Governor Hogan, getting a pretty good deal, right? I mm -hmm. mean, for the most part, like the government runs very well. I work for the state. I can tell you it's a well-run machine. The things that have happened in the city, you, know, you talk about the lack of planning for Hillman or flooding or the taxes going up or the size of the budget, it's going to be a Herculean challenge four years from now. And whoever's mayor is next going to have to do a lot of unpopular things. And kind of like Josh, you know, I'd, I'd beat up Josh during the campaign like, hey, you doubled water bills, you cut trash back. Josh you was in a taxes. shitty position. Yeah, when he, when you he... had a fire. But I mean, think about that. Josh had to fire people, raise taxes, double water bills, cut trash, and still borrow ten million dollars. Like he got dumped on. So for me, it's kind of like if I run again four years from now, if you know we think about it, it's the right thing to do. Do I really want to like do all that all over again? Hmm. So I got to think about it. It's well, you're savvier. Though. You know? I mean, you got to figure out how old were you when you were elected? Thirty. All right, you're thirty, and you're like, holy shit, I just got elected. Like there had to be that moment yeah. where I mean. You're feeling good, but then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, you wake up hyperventilating, going, "I was elected." You know, I mean, <laughs> you're 30. You don't know. You know. You all of a sudden, you're mayor of the of the, yeah. of the wealthiest state per capita in the wealthiest country in the world, and yeah. all of a sudden, you're mayor of that. So after four years, I mean, you've got and coming out and looking back in the election, you got to be like going, "All right, I I know what the hell I'm doing right now." That's like you know what to say, you know, yeah. where to focus, you know, I'm talking about an form yeah. of an election. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that would be, I don't want to say a low hanging fruit because it's not a slam, obviously, but you're not coming in, you're, you're coming in battle tested. Right. You know, and that, that's the difference. Yeah. We gotta, we'll see what the future holds. I'm not sure. What, we're what other do. offices might you consider? Um, you know, it's interesting. Everybody wanted me to run for a delegate or county council. And I was like, I have no interest in running in this election. And they were like, why? I said, look, I said, there was a 20% it, I try to be pretty bipartisan, 20% increase in Democratic turnout. I said the number of people that are going to come out, because, you know, I talked to Ron George and Steve and their pollings up. I'm like, you're not anticipating, you know, 10, 20,000 more people that are going to come out that aren't going to vote for you. And I was like, there's no way in which right. people are going to win this year. People yeah. are like, well, we'll give you money. We'll help you. I'm like, not interested. The Trump effect really yeah. hurt a lot of moderate Republicans. Yeah. Yeah, Steve got beat up on that. And I don't think it... He's, it surprised me he lost. I'm going to well, put it that yeah. way. It's not fair to just say, well, Trump was president, so you lost. I think. No, no, no. Yeah. I don't, I don't think so either. I mean, he, he, but he, he made some clumsy steps, but not too bad. I mean, yeah. just kind of, but at the he same did. time, I think there yeah. was the, like you said, is there was that, that influx of Democratic voters that mm -hmm. wouldn't have come out in the midterm, but then since they're there voting, they, you know, they're just, they're just hitting D across the line. Yeah. Well, Pendulum swing. Same thing in 2010 with the Tea Party. A lot of people right. came out that were upset, and it goes back and forth. Maybe four years from now, it'll go the other way. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. But, so where might you run? I don't know. I've thought about it. I mean, you know, you could do delegate, county council, something like that. Got a Hogan yeah. panel, ladies, president, vice president. <laughs> nah, there, right? no, right. going, no, to, no. Any, going to New Hampshire anytime soon? Mike? No, no, no. <laughs> Although, interesting trivia fact. So when the trivia. governor's father ran for um, governor, you mm -hmm. know, he didn't win. But when he ran, who was his running mate? What year was it? Uh, man, I actually don't know the answer to that. Sometime in the 60s. Oh, I do know this. Um, I'm drawing a blank on it. He has something similar with me. Oh, Agnew? No. No. I was going Greek. It is Greek. Who? Greek person. It was the last Greek mayor of Annapolis, uh, John Apostle. Apostle. Oh, I didn't know that. He was, that's how like my parents knew him. Yeah, he was Hogan's running mate when he ran for governor. I could go for a euro right now, speaking of which. Yeah. Did he, is he the one that committed suicide? Um, no, he left. So, <laughs> speaking of mayors, like, well, it, bring it, that down, it's, huh? it's all about how tough of a job it is. So, he quit and went to Florida. I guess he was like, I'm done. Then, ugh, I'm drawing a blank on oh, the. he quit. He quit. He was just like, I'm done. I'm leaving. Yeah, left. those days, though, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the guy that came after him afterwards, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. He ended up killing himself. And then Mayor Chambers came in after that. Right. Right. I, see, I didn't know that till like, last year. That was yeah, the first time yeah, I ever yeah. heard of that. Mm -hmm. Tough town. Right? <laughs> it was it was yeah. Speed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was your surprise on the um, city council when you were 
Mayor. Who was who was the surprising one that you thought would be um, difficult to work with, but that you found out being very reasonable? Um, so ironically, it was Ross Arnett, the one who tried to strip all my powers uh -huh. away. We actually became close at the end, and you know he's very good on the budget and we'd worked through a lot of things and it was very reasonable because you know i came in there like this guy's trying to take my power away but that we, was we were clumsy that was just yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. because at the time it's like i don't know why everyone's getting so upset and like, all the optics of this are pretty bad right 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 that was funny yeah that was that, that that was amusing well you have to have a kinship though with with previous mayors i mean I, I, like you know you and josh seem like you know you both lost the tough elections that mm -hmm. they're very close and that's got to be really rough when if you get blown out of the water that's one thing but yeah. you know but when it's you know fairly tight but uh i mean even looking at gavin now you have to have some sort of brotherhood because you could you understand what's yeah. going through and so even I, if you disagree so, with it like i said i was in a community meeting and i came to it late i thought um alderman rodriguez was going to be there and the mayor was too and it was with three or four community associations and it was talking about the land swap so we have a public works building which is partly condemned plan was to rebuild it the mayor said i don't want to do it i want to put up residential housing which you know for any mayor to propose more housing in annapolis typically doesn't right. go over well but he wanted to flip it with um the spot on forest drive right at the intersection of spot no hilltop hilltop and forest and where that church sign yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. where the oh, power yeah. lines are right where the american legion is and people like trudy mcfall was there and just grilling them i mean she went in there and was like well what's the land difference i mean it's three million dollars right so from my point of view i'm like wait we're swapping land with them because that land is much more valuable so that the developer is going to get three million dollars profit what do we get it's like well they'll build us some pedestrian bike bridges to offset the cost and i'm like i get a bike bridge and they get three million dollars hey i'll build you three bike yeah, bridges yeah. <laughs> you know let me do that right <laughs> make 40 million dollars um but she went in there and she was like this is so old annapolis not one annapolis you know you're taking a public works building which nobody wants in their neighborhood and you're putting it in a black neighborhood you know backing up to it how would you feel if you had public work trucks in yours and just like laying into him and i was like man i do not miss being up there right now. <laughs> you know yeah. with all the grief but she brought up good points, but no, nah, I mean, I still watch council meetings. You know, you miss it, but... Um, do you miss I, Robert Eads? Huh? Do you miss Robert Eads? Nah, I don't miss I him. love I love I, I would be at home, and I would get a text from John. He goes, you watching council? I'm like, no. And he's like, Eads is coming up. And I'm just I'm just go and take the remote from my kid's hands. And, turn. <laughs> and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, and they go, oh, this guy. And we just watch. It was... Yeah. I'm sure it sucked for you, but for us, it was it was great watching. There used to be a guy, and I don't know whether Josh had experienced him, but I know Ellen did. He would get up and, because um, you get three minutes to speak, mm -hmm. whatever you want to speak about, as long as it's not on the agenda. And he would recite Shakespearean soliloquies. Hmm. Get up I would have enjoyed that sometimes. Nice, yeah, I like you know, nice Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? <laughs> that worked right. Yeah. I, I, and I he looks around at all the council. Thou. Art more lovely, <laughs> you know? and everyone feels a little bit awkward. It's like, okay, don't make eye contact. But it was, it was kind of funny. What happened to Santa Claus? A little bit of levity. Frank, Frank Bradley, he's still around. Is he? I haven't yeah. seen him up there for a while. Yep, he was Santa. He was Santa's helper this year. We'll edit that out. <laughs> I'm not ruining no kids' Christmas. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for all of our kids' listeners. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'll tell you, Mike Penn, ladies, thank you very much for your insight. Yeah. Always valuable. Um, Good luck in your next race, and we will uh, want to keep an eye on that and see whether it might be in the city of Annapolis or elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, it's not with Governor Hogan. Do you think Governor Hogan's going to run? Um, I honestly don't know. And I had this conversation with somebody the other day, and I said, it, it's a different dynamic because you don't control your own destiny. So mm -hmm. here's what I think about it. If Governor Hogan runs and he faces Donald Trump in a head-to-head -head race, I think he wins. And the reason I think he wins is if you look at Donald Trump, he only got 30 to 35 percent when he ran the first time. So you figure that means 65 to 70 percent of people voted against you, even in a Republican primary. Mm -hmm. Right. So how did Donald Trump win? Yeah, it's 17 people splitting the vote. Right. So there's always going to be this, let's say, 50 to 60 percent block that probably doesn't want to vote for President Trump. So if it's the two of them head to head, I think you can win. The challenge is, you know, if you start throwing in Marco Rubio, John Kasich, and you start splitting up that anti-Trump vote, it makes it too hard. It's here, here, Here's my position. Well, first of all, Kasich mm -hmm. will declare his candidacy on the 21st in Washington, D.C. Hmm. There's my prediction. See if okay. that comes true. Um, about 7 p.m. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, uh, but I think uh, I think Hogan will get in on it. I don't think he'll win. 
I hmm. think that he, why is that? Um, because I think you've got to go back in a long time in history before you see a party dump an incumbent. You know, 1865. Um, 90%. I mean, it's it's, it's a long time. It's Republicans. very rare to be yeah. almost unprecedented. But I think that Hogan would be in wise to go in there and come through as this non-Trump candidate. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's a guy that's able to work in a predominantly blue state as a as a red governor, mm-hmm. moving it to the purple, working for both sides of this thing. He could go head to head with them, and he could do very well with them. I mean, he mm-hmm. wouldn't be like O'Malley going like, uh, "Can I talk now, please?" You know, <laughs> oh, yeah, that was great. Uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, he he would he would get in there, he would mix it up, okay. And coming out of it, even though Trump might win that nomination, <laughs> they're going to remember Hogan. And I'll tell you, if if Trump were to win a second term, which I do believe he probably will, you think so? I I, I, I don't, don't know. I, don't I mean, with Biden coming in, maybe not. But I mean, my concern with Biden is he's very old. He's two I, years older than Trump. I know. But okay, that's my concern. I mean, there's, I was know. talking to a Democrat friend, and they were talking about you got one of those. Uh, I got lots of Democrat <laughs> friends. I've appointed lots of Democrats to boards and commissions, um, and we were talking about you know who to win. They were saying like Elizabeth Warren and all these people, and I was like, if you want to beat Trump, I was like, you need the most boring, plain, vanilla person you've ever met. Like, not to say Al Gore's boring, but somebody like that. Like, if you get. Alexander or Ocasio Cortez, someone like that. Yeah, Trump's going to win a landslide. But if you get just a, a boring guy that has no personality, who's like, "Hey, I'm going to be a bureaucrat and get the job done," it's, I think they would beat him. But it comes down. Like, to what a, do you think? I don't know. It comes down to a numbers game, and this is what I've, I've preached online: is that first of all, you, it's going to come down to the debates. That's where all the action is going to happen, and and Joe Biden can handle him. In a debate. Which was amazing. I mean, if you look at the last presidential debate and the primary and the other ones I mean oh. the things people said like like could you imagine Gavin and I saying those things yeah. but, but it's he, mind blown so Hillary won she, she had a three million vote win essentially with the, with the popular vote mm-hmm. and come down to the electoral college the reason that he won the presidency was because he won the electoral college and the reason he won the electoral college is because he won four key districts in Wisconsin Michigan and Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and he won a combined 50,000 votes. So he yeah. won by 50,000 votes. He has not grown his base at all, and it's even shrunk a little bit. He would have to maintain his entire base mm-hmm. right now and have everyone vote for him who voted for him before, before, not have any more Democrats who came out. And the reason that Hillary lost a lot is right. she would have won by more is because Democrats assumed she was going to win, so they didn't yep. have to vote. Yep. Yep. So you'd have to keep the voters he had. You'd have to... He'd have to make sure that the Democratic voters wouldn't come out. He'd have to win those four key districts again, which the Democrats ignored last time because mm-hmm. they were idiots. Mm-hmm. They're not going to ignore it again. In fact, look where they're having they're having their uh, their convention in Wisconsin. Convention. So I'm not saying that he won't win. I'm just saying it is going to be incredibly difficult uphill for it. But, but, but then I, mean, I think, I think the, the Democrats are going to split that vote down. I mean, I think. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to get it watered down, like you said. In what? But, in the primary? Huh? I'm talking about a general election, a primary. You know, you well, that's, yeah, that's fine. In the primary, it's going to water down. But, I mean, you're going to get some people that are, A, not going to come out. or I don't think so. I think you're going to see. Well. You think that was a record vote Last in midterms? Year? Oh, yeah, huge. It is going to be massive on, on both sides. It's yeah. going to be unbelievable. And a lot of people, a lot of the Democrats didn't come out to vote because they assumed it was a done deal. A lot of the Bernie people thought it was going to win. Yeah. Kind of a protest vote. All right, so we're going to set up our next meeting November 7th, yeah. 2020. Yeah, I mean... Is that... We'll, 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 see, we'll see, how, see how this all works we'll out. We'll see how the prediction works out. Yeah. Um, well, former Mayor Mike Panel, ladies, thank you very much for coming in. I appreciate it. We, it's always good to catch up. And uh, don't be such a stranger sometime. And you got something on your mind, give us a call. I will. I'll make sure I text and email you guys all the inside scoop on what's going on. Good. There you go. And announce, announce your candidacy for whatever it is on here. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll pay you. We will not. this has been the maryland crabs podcast with tim hamilton and john fernay sure to follow them in all the regular places facebook twitter youtube and online at the marylandcrabs.com take a moment to rate us on itunes now get the hell out of my kitchen seriously go you're still here it's over Go home. Go.